Our story begins today in 1851 at the Steel Knot and Joseph Hampton Limited of Woden Works, based in Wednesbury, here in England. The business was founded by Joseph Hampton. He had a tool making business that produced a wide range of products, including copying presses, floor cramps, lifting jacks, pipe wrenches, and ratchet drill braces. After many successful years in business, in 1888, the family business had a bit of a tiff. And we find that William's sons, Charles and Joseph, left the family business and moved to Sheffield, where they founded a firm called C&J Hampton, based in the Eagle factory in Sheffield. They initially produced marlin spikes and specialized castings, but by 1908, they were making a range of tools, including vices, pipe vices, pipe cutters, and all kinds of cramps, wrenches, and jacks. The firm in 1908 became a limited company, and in 1909, they registered the record trademark, which became well known in a very short space of time. The two brothers, as they often did, soon fell out, and Joseph returned to Wednesbury, leaving Charles to run the business alone. He was soon joined by his two sons, Horace and Charles, and the business went from strength to strength to strength. Up until 1930, their production consisted of engineering and woodworking vices, with many other tools, including pipe cutters, stilsons, and lifting jacks. By 1912, the company had then relocated to a new factory on Ouse Road in Sheffield. And in 1929, Charles Hampton died, and his two sons, Horace and Charles W. Hampton, became joint managing directors, and the company moved to Bernard Road in 1936. A key point in records history was in 1931, where they launched the campaign of Buy British, which was launched to tackle the competing markets that the USA put against the British, with the Bailey patterned style hand plane. Stanley USA's patent had ran out by 1930, and the record company produced numbers of a number two, right up to a ten and a half, as well as the non-standard Bailey pattern style planes. From this side of the business, saw a massive changes from 1931 up until the quieter demand of the 1960s, where carpenters and woodworkers were no longer using hand tool woodworking, and saw the introduction of electric power tools hit the market. We jump forward now to 1972 and the company merged with William Ridgway to form the Record Ridgway Tools Limited and was made up of 14 UK companies with five overseas companies. In 1982 we saw the takeover of Record Ridgway by the AB Barco Company of Sweden. This arrangement was short-lived and a managed buyout was announced in 1985, returning the company to British ownership, to Record Holdings PLC. In 1998, the board decided to accept the offer from the American Tool Corporation and formed Record Irwin. Within the late 90s, we see great upheaval within the firm and the company was named a further three times in the late 1990s, Record Tools Limited, Record Holdings PLC, and then Record Tools Limited, and a division of the American Tool Companies Incorporated. The record name still lives on today. Unfortunately, where it was produced, manufactured, and built in Britain, now the works have been since closed and possibly knocked down. The information on the internet is not quite clear, but the Parkway Works in Sheffield has new industrial sites on there looking to be rented out for a number of years. We jump forward now to more recent history and we find a new venture was formed under the brand name of Record Power, manufacturing power tools for the woodworking industry but no longer manufactured here in England. The reality is this isn't uncommon and with an ever-changing world and ever-changing companies, it is cheaper, more cost-effective to manufacture in places like China. With this in mind, there's no reason why we can't restore, reuse, 
repurpose and remain the custodians of these vintage tools of our heritage. Hi guys, hope you like the uh, bit of a history lesson there and uh, a brief history and understanding of uh, record vices. Um, I'm now going to show you the collection that I have and the one that I've just bought today is the 25. I have a number three and I have a number one and I have a Woden, I'm not sure the model, a 86B slash 00 and I also really like these bullet style vices and these are I think Polish or Czech I think but these are York vices and we've got a number one with a swivel base and we have a number 80 little uh, little baby one there. I do have a few more smaller sizes. Um, I have got a really small baby, uh, baby bullet vice, which is, uh, which is quite nice. The whole purpose of today is a restoration of this number 25, uh, which is a six inch, six inch jaw. And that was my previous number three. So as you can see, quite a big difference. And quick release. Lovely. And here you can see the uh, the overall difference between a 25, a number 3, and the little baby number 1. I don't plan on being in this workshop forever. There's a few tools I'd love to own, but it's just not the right uh, it's just not the right size and shape of workshop. I'd love to get myself a really nice table saw to to do more on uh, on woodworking. But for now, I'm happy to uh, do the restorations and. Uh, and get ready for the when the time's right to move into the the larger better sized out workshop um so this is one of the reasons that uh, that i bought this vice i had the i've had the number three and the number one for for many many years the number one i've never really used because i had the number three um but my idea is to place multiple sizes um around the parameter of the workshop um and you're always near them so yes i do have quite a few vices but uh, nothing on what many people have here I'm, uh, I'm also very lucky to be uh, uh, to, to live very close to where this was originally made, so I'm about probably 30, 40 miles away from uh, uh, from Sheffield, um, which you know is, is is great for surplus stuff. There's always things available on Facebook Marketplace and eBay that uh, that I am always being able to collect at uh, at pretty good prices, uh, to be fair. So pretty happy with this one. Unfortunately for me, and uh, and some of you eagle-eyed watchers will notice that uh, in the body of the vice, uh, there's a the where the thread guide for the buttress thread actually contacts is broken off. It, it has no effect on the uh, functionality of the vice by any means, but uh, uh, it has definitely been opened before this, and uh, but it's fine. It does the job. I'd give the general condition of the vice as about probably eight out of ten. It's been used and I think it's been sat for a while, so I'm, I'm struggling here to uh, to break it down, but it's it's not too bad, to be honest. It's it's not hard at all. So I'm using a um, an impact driver, and I'm just going to be putting on uh, onto the flatheads here is engaging the uh, tip into the screw and then hitting it with a uh, with a hide mallet to uh, to be able to uh, take off that front cap to uh, to get the lead screw out. question might be raised as why I'm using uh, a manual impact driver and not my electric or pneumatic uh, pneumatic one. The, the, what I find is the small impact drivers are fantastic for uh, flatheads because you don't run the risk of, uh, of, of damaging them and it's always a good start to start with something a little bit more controllable like the, uh, the hand driver to, to try and get something out. And this is the uh, the ever famous buttress thread. So I believe this is a 45.7 uh, buttress thread, which means uh, the uh, the thread form is a 45 degree and a and a seven degree relief taper, and very very popular within uh, within vices. Um, I, I 
I am assuming that all of the record vices, uh, at least that I own, are all uh, this buttress, buttress thread and uh, it's designed uh, to have a very very high strength for one direction so something like a vice is, uh, is an ideal uh, an ideal for that I'm not 100% sure of how to date the vices um, I don't think this particular one is of the best quality that I've seen of record and it seems to be in a little bit of a strange transition period because the thread forms to me they should be uh, 5 16 but they I check them with a uh, with a gauge and they're more like eight millimeters to me now obviously it's very common pitch and thread size um, and they're very similar um, in in characteristics but the head of the screw was definitely 3 16 but the thread I think was more of an 8 mil than um, uh, than eight millimeters. What I always do now from, from when I'm buying vices is the first thing to do is I inspect the jaws, but more typically is the condition of the bolts that are in the jaws. This one I, I didn't think was as bad as this, um, but I've walked away from quite a few that, that seem to be a really good deal, um, but aren't particularly that good. And from taking all this apart and discovering that, that there is a part that's broken on it, um, there's not a great deal that I could really uh, that I could really do because it was a from a state sale, if you like. So I'm happy with it, and if it's got any issues, I can always fix it. Right, this next one is going to be difficult. So we've got the one on the left, and now the one on the right is rounded over. So it's a 3 16 um, Allen countersink head. <sighs> we'll get out. So we've got that one in. We used a punch just to open up because it had a, uh, rolled a burr over on the top. So we use this just to push the burr back out and then tap it over and then see if we can get it out. <sighs> Easy. Not great. Could be worse. So that's the breakdown uh, now all nice and completed and we've got to the uh, to the roller coaster ride if you like and we're now at the uh, the bottom of the ride and now we're going to start building back up again and uh, fixing improving grinding etc so uh, I'm going to degrease everything first and I'm going to use this gunk that I've been using I just use a wire brush and a blowtorch to get rid of some of that nasty old crud um, from there I'm going to use the uh, wire wheel to, to, to clean it all up and then uh, and then paint it by hand when I've finished I have had quite a few messages from uh, from people mainly on Instagram to be honest um, about what this base is and um, it's it, for me I thought everybody knew what one of these are but it's for uh, pottery I think and, uh, and sculpting so I bought it from a, an auto jumble off a, uh, for, off a lovely old lady and uh, they're quite expensive to buy new, but I, I paid a fiver for it, and uh, and I had to carry around, <laughs> I had to carry it around the whole day, and uh, it, I looked like a carrying a dumbbell around with me, so it wasn't the easiest thing to move around, but definitely worth it. And if I find another one, hundred percent, I'll buy it, and I recommend you guys do as well. It comes in so so handy. For the half nut and the slides, I'm going to uh, degrease them and. Uh, and paint whatever needs painting 
and I'm just using vinegar uh, some parts are a little bit rusty uh, but it's also pretty good for um, removing rust removing paint to a certain degree if it's fairly loose already uh, but this is a project over uh, over a few days so I'm gonna leave this overnight and I'll come back in the morning and see what the results are this is now the breakdown of the uh, of the sliding jaw and um, again using the uh, the rotary base just to um, show everything off inside is absolutely fine I'm not going to bother painting it um, the outside is definitely doing and uh, and cleaning up but I'm uh, I'm pretty happy uh, I am pretty happy you can see the the broken uh, the broken butcher thread guide at the front um, but it doesn't affect the the performance of the vice so um, I like to lay everything out and get everything uh, get everything in stages and uh, it feels like it's not such a big project if you break it down into little bits you see so that was me that's my idea And here we are in the next day, and we're going to go through the parts and uh, and start wire wheeling and uh, cleaning and priming and painting today. So I'm um, just going to empty out all the vinegar, inspect the parts, and uh, see what they see what they've turned out like. And now there's a time for the bright yellow grinder to come out. <laughs> I had a few comments actually on uh, on a post that I put on. It was, a, it was a message that why is everything you've got blue and then your angle grinder is yellow? Well, I have got a cordless Makita grinder and my wired, my cabled grinder is a DeWalt. Purely for the fact I don't like the Makita small four and a half inch grinder. Uh, I had, uh, I've, I've, since I've ever done metalwork, I've only ever had DeWalt grinders, and I've owned three of them in my lifetime, and they only break when I mistreat them or don't look after them, so I can't complain, the spot on, I love them, and the quality is, I think, superior than the Makita, but apart from that, I'm a Makita man, 100%. Not that there's anything wrong with the Makita at all. I know they've been a staple for industry for many, many years, and I don't know what the nine-inch ground is like. But the four and a half inch was 750 watts. The Dewalt was over a thousand, and uh, you just stick to what you know. You stick to what you're used to. But nothing beats a 40-year-old motor with a pig's tail bolted on the end of it with a wire brush. We now have everything wire wheeled and sort of clean. A few little bits more to do and we've uh, wire brushed the wheel just using a rotary wire brush on the angle grinder and i just thought i'd i'd show you actually um and look around my workshop of what's actually made in record what made by record uh, back in the day and i think just examples that i've got is i've got a multitude of um g clamps here that are all very very handy if you haven't seen how i make this check out the uh check out the video and these are the wood planes that we mentioned earlier so i've got a selection um so i've got the four fours and a half i've got another draw with uh, ones that aren't quite as sort of in decent condition i don't like to restore these and go mad um i like them to be in their sort of state uh, and clean them up a little bit so i've got a few records uh the six and the five and we've got a big Stanley number seven. Still haven't found a number eight yet, but uh, yeah, just a little bit more history and, uh, and what I've got. We used to be pretty good at making things in this country. It's, uh, it's a shame we don't do more of it. Uh, but I, 
I don't know if we've started making some of the things that we used to do before. I don't know where we'd start or who'd do it. Um, engineering is my is my business and uh, and and it's my working profession. And uh, I I do get the chance to meet quite a few companies. And uh, is the skill still out there? Mm, don't know. I'll let you guys decide that. But I don't think. Depending on the product, depending on the product, but uh, I think certain industries and uh, and being that the uh, the engineering brush is is such a wide one at that, it's uh, it's 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 still it's still amazing what we do make, but at the same time we it's nice to reminisce. It it is nice to reminisce. I've made sure to mask up uh, the the rear slide of the vice, and I'm using a mohair roller which I have got a lovely set of, uh, of DeBille Bliss um, suction and drop fed spray guns that I'll probably not use for, well, they're there if I need them like many tools I own. Um, but I use these mohair rollers with um, coach enamel and turns out great. Another top tip if you are doing restorations on uh, old machinery uh, and you don't really want to get into spray painting, uh, which I could do if I wanted to, uh, but I use uh, boat paint, so boats that are for uh, steel uh, steel hull boats, and the paint is really, really good. It's a coach enamel, and it gives off this really, really beautiful shine, and it's quite good, strong paint. My recommendations is don't buy cheap boat paint, although most boat paints are very expensive, um, but in general, if you go for the medi medium sort of to high range of the market, then you are going to get a really nice finish on your restorations. Could be better, but it could be a down sight worse. A few inches later. Hi guys, welcome back. It's the next day. Uh, we've got everything painted. I put another coat on this morning. Uh, we're still leaving a fingerprint uh, mark some places, but went really, really well. Looks good. Now what we need to do is fit the jaws. I've gone for uh, some new stainless A2 uh, countersunk head by a 25mm long uh, bolts. They all work fine, so I think these are 8mm. Uh, the only issue that I have got is these heads don't go into the actual drawer itself and um, they're not deep enough on the countersink. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put these on the lathe and machine um, one part off and take about 82 millimetres off here um, so it fits in the drawers. So let's go over to the lathe and uh, get started. What I did earlier. In true Blue Peter fashion. Uh, so I've taken off, as I say, about 80,000 on there and that's just going to sit uh, just below the just below the surfaces of the jaw there the standard ones that we've got are just a little bit over but obviously we don't want that uh, we don't want that protruding so what we're going to do is we are going to put two nuts on there tighten those up and then we'll be able to to clamp those in the three jaw and uh, then we can machine down the top of this head would like to point out the reason of using the uh, putting on two nuts onto the um, the shaft of the thread is I don't want to um, put these hard stainless on my three door chuck so using the using uh, two nuts to lock itself uh, onto the uh, onto the thread and then it's uh, six sided so three sided can go in the three jaw so uh, I'm sure most of you would understand that, but I, I just want to be uh, as clear as possible. So here I'm just going back and forth, uh, checking and making sure that uh, that everything is okay. And I'm going to use a rule to uh, check and make sure that it's nothing sat proud and they're nice and flush. Just in case you were wondering, I use the uh, calipers. Uh, for the first off and I set them to the uh, the first one that I did and then for each comparison that I made is I was able to to use that to make sure that I'm in right. I don't have adjustable dials on this lathe it's something that I will invest in or, or probably a DRO when the time's right um, so I find just making it as easy as possible the, the numbers on the tiles are really small and I do struggle to see them um, but the uh, I took off uh, around 70 80 thou from from each one 
the faces on some of them I had to take off a little bit more because I think the jaws on here must have been a Friday afternoon job and they were protruding on one of them and I could countersink them but it's they are very very hard jaws so that uh, I think that would have been a little bit of a challenge there so I didn't uh, didn't go for that option uh, the fit up I oiled everything and stoned all the sliding surfaces and just started to to get everything ready uh, copper slipping all bolts um, and fastenings on here and again using the way oil for anything that slides or rotates and that's going to be a wrap for tonight guys thank you so much for watching really hope you liked the video if you did please hit the like please hit that subscribe have a comment send me photos of your record vices that'd be fantastic and if you know any more uh, information please share with myself and uh, and the other viewers thanks guys have a good night